Hello, good morning, good afternoon to those joining us uh, in various time zones. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program um, and the Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, welcome to the first panel discussion of the fifth annual UAE Security Forum. Uh, we heard earlier in the opening keynote session from Dr. Ahmed al Mandari, the Regional Director for the Eastern Mediterranean at the World Health Organization, and we continue our deep dive into the healthcare challenges in the region with an excellent panel of distinguished experts. I will make a quick introduction, uh, then share their full bios with all of you in the chat. Uh, joining us uh, from Dubai is Layla Lail Jasmi, founder and CEO of Health Beyond Borders, a healthcare advisory firm focused on healthcare strategy and research, health investment facilitation, healthcare business development in the United Arab Emirates, and medical tourism consulting and facilitation. Prior to this, she was the CEO of Health Policy and Strategy at the Dubai Health Authority, where she was responsible for the development of policy and legislation for the health system in the Emirate of Dubai. She has extensive knowledge of healthcare systems, health reform, strategic direction and planning, and delivery of healthcare services. Uh, from, uh, he was supposed to be from neighboring Abu Dhabi, but today he's joining us from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, Dr. Juan Acuna is uh, the Assistant Dean for Research and the Chair for the Department uh, of Epidemi Epidemiology uh, and Public Health at Khalifa University College of Medicine and Health, and Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. Acuna has more than 35 years of experience in clinical practice, as well as academic medicine, teaching and research. He was senior service fellow for 11 years uh, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. Before that, he was assistant uh, vice president for research at Florida International University and the founding chair for the Department of Medical and Population Health Sciences Research. Uh, he has that funding from the National Institutes of Health and for his research, uh, and he has published and presented more than 100 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters and was principal editor on three books. And a bit closer to home, uh, a true celebrity for those of us who have been constantly following the medical coverage uh, during this pandemic, Dr. Jennifer Nutzo, senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, associate professor for, uh, at the uh, at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Dr. Nuzu is an epidemiologist by training. Her uh, work focuses on global health security with a focus on pandemic preparedness, outbreak detection and response, uh, health systems as they relate to global health security, biosurveillance and infectious disease diagnostics. Uh, she directs the Outbreak Observatory, which conducts operational research to improve outbreak preparedness and response. Uh, she is also the lead epidemi epidemiologist uh, for the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 Testing Insights Initiative housed within the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. Uh, welcome again to all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, before we start, I'd just like to remind everyone that this webinar is being held on the record. Uh, it is being recorded and will be, ma will be made available uh, on our website uh, as soon as tomorrow. Our audience is in listen-only mode, uh, but you will be able to ask the questions through the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Okunia, I'd like to start with you. Um, although now you, uh, you are in, in, uh, in Colombia, uh, you had been kind of on, on the forefront of uh, uh, a pandemic response in the UAE. Uh, so uh, with question to you, how do you evaluate the local response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the UAE? Uh, how prepared was the system uh, to face such a pandemic in your opinion? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, first for having me, this is a great invitation and I, uh, I, I love it, uh, and congratulate uh, you for putting together this forum that allows us to, to present what I think is one of the good experience globally. Uh, and is, I was very lucky to start uh, my job at, uh, at Khalifa University uh, when the pandemic started. I started in December and you remember that coincides with the first cases. So, so basically out of the year, I spent six months in a hotel room uh, meeting virtually with everybody in the Emirates and and, uh, and connecting and try to uh, lead this uh, situation from, from, that, uh, from, from that setting. Um, I, I did not know much about the Emirates. I, I went there uh, just to join Khalifa University and um, as, as an academician to start the medical school. 
And uh, and because of my experience at CDC and because it was a pandemic, I, I ended up connecting with the public sector and the departments of health, uh, the part of the Dubai Health Authority and the Ministry of Health, and uh, and ended up chairing the the epidemiology research committee uh, for the pandemic. So so uh, in in sharing thoughts. Uh, uh, and by the way, I ended up there for the whole year. So I'm vacation now mm -hmm. uh, since two days ago. That's why I am Bogota, my, my home city. This is where I was born and I studied medicine here. I'm an OBGYN by training, OBGYN geneticist. And then 20 years ago, I started in public health at CDC. So I, I believe that going back to going to the question, um, that definitely the Emirates were were a, a place to be in the pandemic. Uh, it has been amongst uh, by several different ratings, uh, and people invented all kinds of ratings uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, among the uh, 20 best countries to be at uh, in the pandemic. I believe that I can summarize the local response to COVID-19 as uh, number one first, very fast. So a uh, system that were unreactive to the pandemic, uh, systems where there was not a lot of connection between the population and the government, peoples where there was no uh, trust built uh, between the government and uh, the public health sector, and the people and places that distrusted the information coming from science and trusted the information coming from media, which we know now is open for everything from really, really, really bad to really, really, really good. So the problem today is not in public health and in many other areas is not to access the information, is to filter which information is good and which information is not. So from that perspective, the response to the pandemic in the Emirates was very fast. Um, the mandates came based on evidence. Uh, there was a confirmation of national groups that led uh, with top scientists, uh, policymakers, and representatives from all sectors, uh, led the system into taking the first, the, the first and the best decisions since the very beginning. So because of that, it was easy to organize the system. Um, I, I mean, easy compared to other places like the other place where I used to live, the US, which now is a, it has been a disaster all over the place uh, during this past year. And the, um, and, and the, um, the idea was that uh, the trust of the people into the decisions made by government was the one that I believe motivated uh, that things responded well. So we did not have as many cases as many people of, equi uh, of many places of equivalent number of people, population adjusted. Uh, we did not have so many severe cases going into ICUs. We never allow saturation of the ICUs. And if there was in some places, there was a, a preparedness to create further expansion of those ICUs. Uh, the number of physicians was the ones required uh, and everything else was according to a very well laid out plan. So I think that things went well, well, the preparedness was good and the response was very fast, trusted by people and on point with the evidence that was being evaluated day by day. And quickly on how prepared was the system. Nobody was prepared for this. I mean, this, this caught everybody by surprise. Some systems did have more tools, but nobody was really prepared for a pandemic uh, of this nature with a virus of this behavior. And that's why we have seen what we have seen. So I believe that uh, with, with those elements, I can conclude and summarize by saying that with the elements that were available, the government assembled the best possible scientific public health and governmental team and made the right decisions that were implemented very fast and the population trusted them. So the end result was uh, the one that you can see which is one of the best results uh, globally.
That's great. One follow-up question before um, I, I move on to the other speakers. Um, we've seen this week in, in the United States, you referenced the US, um, uh, the, the start of the vaccination campaign, the approval of the second uh, um, uh, a vaccine for emergency use. Uh, uh, in, in your work uh, at Khalifa University, um, uh, there has been also um, uh, some partnerships uh, on, on vaccine development um, and especially uh, test, trial is, uh, test trial is of the uh, Chinese uh, vaccine. Uh, where, where is the UAE right now in terms of uh, administering uh, uh, vaccines and, and uh, in terms of, uh, of reopening uh, the economy based on immunization? So, so uh, uh, the, the, the UAE opened up a partnership with, uh, a, with, with uh, Sinopharm, which is the one that make this uh, Chinese vaccine. And uh, we conducted one of the trials. I, I, I hold a joint appointment actually that was born out of the pandemic, uh, which is I am part-time what you described for Khalifa University and part-time the director for research and development for Saha, which is the biggest uh, health services company in the Emirates. So uh, that's where the, the, the trial was, was conducted. So I think that it was conducted very well, very fast, implemented quite fast, uh, fastly. Uh, we got the right people on board. Uh, it, it was ended in record time. Uh, the information on safety was good. So the second stage was the one uh, that uh, allowed us to accept uh, the government approved the vaccine for emergency use. So it was, it was uh, using in frontline health workers. Uh, I did have the vaccine through that program. So I am one of the persons that got the vaccine. And a, a, what is important is that because of the experience on safety and then uh, monitoring the effectiveness of the vaccine, uh, it was decided very recently to, to open up the, the vaccination program. So that's where we are now. That's great. We'll, we'll get back to that shortly as well. But I'd like to move on to uh, Mrs. Leila Jasmi and uh, uh, just ask, ask you to, to walk us through the, the evolution of the uh, perhaps the healthcare, healthcare sector in, in the UAE. Um, and your experience uh, was in Dubai, but also uh, 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 United Arab uh, Emirates wide. Um, how, how, do we get, how did we get to this point? I think a lot of people have been used to uh, seeing um, uh, uh, locals from the UAE and other Gulf countries seek uh, medical care outside, uh, perhaps in the US and, and in Europe. Uh, but now you have uh, a well-developed system of local hospitals. You have partnerships that have brought um, renowned uh, medical facilities to, to the country. Uh, what has been uh, the strategy to, to get to the point where uh, you have um, a lot of work, a lot of development of, of uh, local responses, uh, and a system that, that can uh, uh, withstand uh, a pandemic? Well, if we look at the healthcare system in the United Arab Emirates, has evolved tremendously over the past 10 years. And if we give the credit to that, we give it to the government, because the government's flexibility and to the regulatory system and to encouraging investments to come into the United Arab Emirates has added a lot of value into the development of the healthcare. Uh, market in the, in the UAE. So if we look, um, I mean, let's say 20 years back, still the government was the major provider of the healthcare service in the UAE. However, if we look now, we see that still the uh, private sector takes a good amount of portion from the delivering of service to the community. Now, if we look at the patients still pursuing treatment outside the country, I think this is a matter that it is being there all over the world. Still, in any other country, you know, like the United States or even in Europe or Asia, still people like to pursue certain treatments out of their own country. So that part is still going to be there. However, if we knew because of the government in the United Arab the bigger portion of the patient being sent abroad is it's actually from the government. So what we have seen in the last past two years, there has been a good amount of decrease in sending patients abroad. And this is very well reflected in the statistics, which is the government uh, produced, whether it is the federal government or the local health authority, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And this is why, because as you mentioned earlier, 
we have been able to attract carrying out healthcare uh, providers from abroad, whether it is within being an affiliated with an existing government uh, hospital, or it is being partnered with some of the healthcare providers, the private healthcare provider in the UAE. And uh, still, I can say we do still have gaps in certain um, services, like the neuromedical, the neurosurgery, orthopedic rehabilitation, sport injuries, and uh, palliative, uh, palliative care for uh, oncology uh, patients. So there are still a few gaps into the healthcare, but it is not compared to what it used to be in the past five to 10 years. Going back to your questions, what makes the UAE attractive to uh, an outsider or uh, let's say an external healthcare provider? I can give the credits to the, to the flexibility that has happened and the regulatory system in the United Arab Emirates and from the investment uh, perspective. If you ask me when I was at the government at that time in the early 2000s, we were not having so much of an encouragement into a PPP model between the private sector and the government sector. Mm -hmm. However, now for the past two to three years, the government launched a PPP model for all the governments of the United Arab Emirates. And that actually has encouraged the private provider to come into partnership with the government. And we have seen it in a different sphere when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to economy uh, sector also. So we have seen that. And I give the credit to the flexibility that has happened to the low regulation system that we do have in the in the. That's great, thank you. Um, Follow-up question, perhaps uh, also to, to uh, Dr. Acuna here. Uh, have you seen the um, um, the education sector uh, keep up with that demand in terms of, you know, training uh, the best uh, uh, medical uh, staff in terms of you know doctors, nurses, and, and other medical practitioners uh, to be able to to meet that demand and to meet um, uh, the de the development in the in the health healthcare sector as well. So from, from my perspective, I've, I, I hold very little history because uh, then again, I, I have been in the Emirates for only uh, one year. I think that it has been a privilege to see uh, a place with such fast and high tech development, uh, as you all know, um, a place that transforms uh, things based on uh, need, identifying the best resources. And it's, it's a place that definitely has the resources to almost implement anything that they would like to implement at the quality or level of complexity that they would like to implement. However, fast growth, uh, we all know that has, it, it has a, a payoff, uh, but it also has a burden. Sometimes you grow, sometimes some part of the system and the rest of the system has not grown accordingly. And uh, that's when you see a little bit of disparities of, of different sectors, but that's, that would be a very technical discussion that, that we could have because I, I seen it in my field of expertise is maternal and child health. And, and you see that there are units that are extremely well developed and there are other services that have not been growing at the same uh, pace but the good thing is uh, we have people that identify those uneven circumstances and there is definitely a very fast, it's probably one of the places what I have seen is mind blowing, the speed of the implementation of any idea, if the idea makes sense and is good for the people. So uh, anytime that something like that is identified, resources are allocated, people are brought in, if, if there are not expertise locally, uh, they work with locals and, and they get things done really, really quickly. So, so that's part of what I mentioned in the pandemic. The response was so quick because, because they, there were the, the, the right amount of ingredients to get this done. Mm -hmm. Now, education, uh, medical education. Uh, well, now I am part of, I am founding faculty of a new medical school. So, so I believe that uh, then again, once a need is identified, then they, they build the necessary infrastructure to, to fulfill that need. In this case, uh, physicians that are mostly local physicians, 
uh, oriented uh, uh, and educated at high levels of subspecialty. Uh, Lila was mentioning uh, about having uh, many of these subspecialty now. And uh, now we have uh, top uh, clinical uh, centers uh, of, of, the, of very high level of complexity in UAE uh, that, that can provide almost any kind of service that can be provided elsewhere. Leila, anything to add on that? Yes, I think uh, what Dr. Kuhn has mentioned is very essential because one of the things that we have seen has changed over the past year is the massive collaboration that has happened between the local health authority, federal government, with the private sector for these newly established center of excellence. This is something we have seen in UAE, which is very impressive, that we have seen a lot of new centers becoming as a center of excellence, whether it is for heart or oncology or for an orthopedic or for rehabilitation. And this is actually has added to the value of that we had a, a good job of patients being sent by the government abroad for a treatment. And when it came to pandemic, it actually was a bit, a bit of a great value for the government because the collaboration that has happened between the federal authority and between the private sector, I think this is the beauty which the UAE went to, which other countries I believe haven't been successful with. And this is which Dr. Kuna has mentioned. So where we have been very fast and to actually uh, getting of um, the over the what has happened and the panic that has happened in the community is that the federal government has been very much collaborative with the private sector in this pandemic. So we had all worked as a one team and this has helped a lot in containing the pandemic in the UAE. Wonderful, thank you. I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Nutsu into this and thank you for your patience, uh, doctor. Um, and, and your observations of, of health systems uh, globally, and we heard a little bit, uh, uh, you know, from Dr. Acuna and, and uh, Mrs. El Jessamy on, on this issue of a relationship between uh, government and 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 and, uh, and the citizens, uh, and the trust uh, factor in there. Uh, so, uh, in your observations of, of um, health systems globally, uh, what are um, uh, the the characteristics that you saw and, and the ones that have been able to cope well? Uh, with this pandemic uh, uh, versus the, the ones that have not. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to chime in on the conversation. It's really interesting. It's been, uh, it's quite interesting to hear um, about the strengths of, of the response um, in, in the region. It's clearly not something that's replicated around the world, but, um, and in particular, you know, when we talk about health systems, um, that has always been my deep worry when it would come to a pandemic like scenario and really kind of any health emergency. Um, I've been part of a team uh, that published the first global health security index, which looked at the um, capacities of 195 countries. And what we found in that analysis is that, um, you know, all countries were going to have challenges. Um, you know, no country was fully prepared for a COVID like 19 scenario. There are of course countries that um, had more than most like the United States that despite um, having, you know, um, more resources than others, you know, essentially chose not to use them. But nonetheless, across the board, um, health systems are the area where countries tend to um, be weakest. And, you know, it's, I think, in part due to the fact that there is this, um, you know, governmental private sector mix um, in many places. And so the locus of control is not quite as clear as, say, when it comes to building a public health laboratory that's very clear cut steps that governments can take to do that. But when you're talking about a, a fairly distributed a uh, network of providers, some of whom work for, may work for government, but many of whom may not. Um, it becomes a much harder thing to marshal. There's also been, I think, a fairly, um, you know, I would say for the community of um, folks who focus on the topic of global health security, like I do, um, I would say that health systems have largely been kind of absent from the conversation um, in ways that I think has been really unfortunate because there has been a lot of effort um, you know, as of late, particularly following the very large um, uh, epidemics of, of Ebola in West Africa, to ready countries to be able to respond when a significant infectious disease emergency would occur um, within their borders in the hopes that we could prevent it from spreading across borders. And I think those efforts have been very important. They have added capacities um, that we are benefiting from today. I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time looking at the global COVID map 
um, that Johns Hopkins produces. And, um, you know, whenever I see on the map that 191 countries are reporting cases, as terrible of a development as that is, um, that we have COVID in 191 countries, the fact that 191 countries are able to detect and report a completely new virus, I think is, is a sign of, of hard work and progress. And that's something to be recognized. But when it comes to health systems, you know, at least in, in that capacity uh, building work has largely occurred um, without inclusion of broader health systems. There is of course a community of, of, of practitioners and, and experts, uh, uh, you know, um, academic experts and others who have um, been quite concerned about the strength of health systems. Um, but when we've done work, uh, it's been remarkable how much of a kind of um, a wall there is between the global health sec uh, security and the health system strengthening communities. And so um, it's, it's really unfortunate because if you look at the kind of pillars of the public health capacities that the global health security community has pushed for, things like um, enhanced surveillance and things like um, risk communication and, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, community level um, steps to slow the spread of the virus that all hinges rests on there being a very strong health system to support that work. And when you ask people about public health, I mean, the average person I think doesn't really understand what public health is, but they've been to their physician, they've been to see a healthcare practitioner. And so I, you know, I think it's really important that we, we do more work to focus on um, bringing health systems into the, the, the work of planning for the events like COVID-19. Likely not going to be the last situation the world faces, and it may not even be the, the biggest challenge. Um, in terms of what places have done well, I mean, it, it's um, it's actually a bit early to tell. Um, we have we're actually our, my a team is going to be embarking on on a project to to identify just that. One of the things that's been clear is um, some countries have done well at certain points of time, and then uh, you know several months later have had bigger struggles. So. The timing element, I think, is important for us to consider. But I, if if I had to guess what the attributes of of the stronger health systems, it's um, likely the places um, where they have had experience um, dealing with either an infectious disease emergency or a natural hazard. And I think that's really important because it, I think, lowers the activation energy to respond. So when you hear about COVID, you know, um, I think there is probably a greater recognition that this could come and there, and to activate protocols. And so places like for instance places that um, had firsthand experience with SARS and saw the um, critical vulnerability of health systems and the need to protect healthcare workers and then the need to to um, you know safely isolate and and um, do contact tracing and things like that it, you know it's I think it's quite clear that countries um, that have had those experience were able to snap into place you mentioned trust and I think that's a really important element of this um, particularly because for many people, the health system is perhaps their view of what public health is, even if public health is typically, um, you know, not at the patient level, but more at the population level. But nonetheless, if they've had you know, negative experiences with healthcare workers, I think that makes the, the job of public health much harder. And certainly we've seen that in pa past outbreak scenarios. So health systems that um, have, you know, a degree of trust they have had experience. They do a reasonable job at meeting the routine needs of, of the population. Um, and because of their experience in, in other emergencies, understand the need to activate and the need to take seriously um, emergency type situations and to uh, work collaboratively with the government. You know, those are my, my, my hunches as to what's gonna float to the top in terms of places that have done well or not. But, you know, I think we're still learning from COVID-19 and, um, uh, you know, I think as this event unfortunately continues on, I think our learning is going to continue to evolve. Um, so, Dr. Nuri, to follow up on one thing that you mentioned in terms of um, um, uh, countries that had, uh, as you were tracking them, uh, tracking their preparedness, had uh, a plenty of resources but chose not not to deploy them. Uh, I'm not asking you to kind of. <laughs> Give us an analysis of, of the U.S. response here, but uh, did you see that in, in other places and, and kind of what, what really drove that? Um, uh, is it just that a um, lack of uh, proper decision making or a lack of coordination? I think it's a few things. I mean, one thing, and you know, I, I don't mind talking about the U.S. experience because I have given some thought as to why in our index, the, the, the Global Health Security Index, um, the U.S. Uh, scores at the top, but has 
fared so poorly with COVID-19. And um, what I've seen happen um, in the U.S., but in other countries, is that, you know, the initial response was probably one of disbelief, where the majority action taken was at the border um, to try to prevent the virus from coming in. And, you know, I think there were some countries that acted earlier to do that and were probably better poised to use border controls to slow the introduction of the virus. But I haven't seen compelling evidence that, um, except for, you know, the New Zealand and the Australias of the world, the, the, the islands that um, were able to sh literally shut borders early um, enough and then uh, use the time that the border controls bought um, to, to prepare domestically. Other than that, um, you know, I think countries that only looked to their borders as, as how they were gonna deal with COVID-19, they lost a tremendous amount of time to focus that where they, where they should have been focusing on domestic action. So they should have been thinking, you know, this virus is likely coming here. It's likely here already that in my view, when the United States chose to close its borders, it, the virus was likely already circulating, but we weren't able to see it because we were only testing people who were traveling from one country, despite the fact that multiple countries were reporting cases. Um, we didn't use that time to uh, think about how we were going to surge capacity in, in, in our hospitals and how we were going to protect doctors and nurses to amass additional stockpiles of, of personal protective equipment, to think about how we were going to expand surveillance. Um, these are all things the U.S. and other, you know, I think high scoring countries know to do. Um, I personally believe there were voices in the government that called for it. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I think there was a political leadership decision that chose not to do it mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So I, I do think that we lost a lot of time. And, you know, that's um, not a great situation to be in. You know, pandemics are very hard to stop when you're talking about a respiratory virus that can spread easily between people that has very nonspecific symptoms. And in the case of this virus, no symptoms. Um, the only thing you really have... Uh, your greatest tool is time and, and acting quickly. And, um, you know, I think a number of countries chose not to. And then, you know, um, I, I do think the political climate in a lot of countries has, has a role to play in so much as when you have political leaders debating the existence of the virus or suggesting that it's nothing that needs to be taken seriously, debating the value or potential ha even harms of, of simple interventions like mask wearing, um, it's, it's really hard to get out ahead when you have a situation like that. And if you have a highly polarized society um, and, and, and political leaders use of that polarization um, in their talking points, you know, I really think that undermines response. So the word trust keeps coming up over and over again. And I think there's a reason for that. People have to trust the message, they have to trust the messenger and they have to trust that taking those actions are in their best interest. And I think a number of countries really struggled with that. Thank you for that. And do you think that also hampered uh, 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 global cooperation in terms of, you know, trying to limit the spread of the virus and coordinate a, a response, uh, given that, as you say, each country was dealing with it differently and, and responding uh, even internally differently? Absolutely. I mean, the, the isolationist tendencies that are playing out right now, you know, I, I understand them in the sense that they are common responses that leaders take when they're dealing with a very serious environment, you know, situation, the, the first thing is, how can I escape this? And so you try to shut your borders and you try to just look inward. Unfortunately, the, the, the attributes of a pandemic are one where it cannot be managed on a country by country basis. Even if a country is doing well, and you know, I think uh, New Zealand and Australia are great examples of this, even if they are doing well, they have gotten the virus under control in their own borders, they remain at risk for the rest of the world and their economies can't be fully restored until the rest of the world gets in gear. So it is a very challenging situation. Add to the fact that we have global supply chains that are incredibly thin, incredibly um, uh, fragile, um, not, you know, the products that the world needs are only produced in a few places. And um, now, even when we're talking about vaccines, um, there are some places that have and some places that have not. And so we really need global approaches to dealing with this. I mean, even, even when a country thinks about applying uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, the, the mitigation strategies, um, it's really hard when you have one country taking a very aggressive approach where they're shutting down everything and its neighbor is not. Um, it's hard because um, the virus is um, 
can leak across borders, um, but also because people see what their neighbors are doing and, you know, they may be miffed that um, they are being subjected to restrictions and their neighbors aren't. So um, I really think it's in our um, operational advantage to find collective approaches to dealing with this virus because the, the, the impacts are collective and our ability to um, return to some level of normalcy depends on our, our, our all achieving that state. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Acuna, I'd like to give you a chance to, to respond to anything that, that you heard, if you have anything to, um, uh, to add to this. Uh, but also, I'd like to uh, transition uh, to more of uh, uh, lessons learned and, and uh, preparedness for future pandemics uh, and ask you kind of on the scientific front uh, where, where you were, where you're based on for your full time job. Um, what are the biggest uh, takeaways in terms of uh, building local capacity? Uh, to combat future, future pandemics um, and, uh, and, and, and kind of in, in your work and also in uh, not necessarily uh, just building local capacity, but, uh, uh, but working uh, globally uh, on uh, future coordination in terms of uh, uh, teaming up for, for um, uh, vaccine research or in, uh, any other areas that you'd like to comment on. Yes, thank you. So uh, what, what I think is that, that the pandemic, uh, well, first and foremost, the baseline is that health and uh, education are almost never, almost nowhere at the forefront of investment. And uh, so, so it's, it's always the, the sectors that are surviving in the middle and that are maintained by uh, you know, some more goodwill decisions than, than, than real support. Uh, having said that, some countries do better and some countries have better systems. Uh, the US, I believe, was one of those, for instance. Um, and, um, and, and, and the pandemic, what it did is that it was a stress test for the health systems and for the overall system. So, when, when the pandemic came, the government as the main responsible for the people and for the systems needed to be on board with this. And those governments that were not on board with the pandemic and, and created this belief, uh, we, we can follow the story by following the epidemiological curves of those countries and you can see who did well, who did really bad, who were able to flatten the curve, who, who, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So needless to say, uh, when you have a country that is led by uh, a, 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 a president, and, and I'm not talking about the US, but I, of course, including the US, because there are many other countries, and, and the president has uh, quite a sensible amount of followers. And those followers follow blindly the instructions and the attitude and the speeches of the president. And the president says, this is a flu, it's no big deal. We have been here, uh, don't worry about the mask. Then what people does reflects those, don't worry about anything. This is just a flu, let's don't use masks. And because they don't see the deaths one by one, they don't feel that is really a problem. And the more people get into the course of disease that is benign, the more people that say this disease is really a flu is not important because they don't see that people dying in the hospitals. So sensitization by the government into the countries regarding the importance of an, uh, a situation like the pandemic was very important and it did not happen in many places. Number one. Number two, uh, you have talked about it, everybody has talked about it, and I mentioned it, trust in the system. So when the system is evidence-based, when the system tries to do things well, but when there is a background of trust then things work better because things in a pandemic change too fast. Then again, this is a stress test and anything that is broken is just going to break further. So you will recognize even in some sectors of your health system and of your government, the things that you thought were working fine, but were not uh, really. 
So they do not withstand the pressure of the pandemic. So what they will learn, uh, and this is big lessons, and maybe I am missing somebody for which I apologize in advance, but one of the big ahas that we have was uh, in the Emirates, uh, there is a lot of data, but extracting information out of those data became very challenging. So one of the lessons for the future is health data in these circumstances is crucial for a quick and swift response. You cannot move a whole health system in a country and respond to save people's lives and make the right decisions unless you have the right information. And by definition, these pandemics are many times unknown. And COVID-19 was the worst of it because it was big, it was serious, and it was completely unknown. So nobody really knew nothing about the virus, how it behaved, uh, when, when you go from a case to a population, what do you need to take into account? So all those circumstances caused that when the system was stressed, we learned what worked bad. Mm -hmm. And those things are being fixed. So now surveillance, which is rare to have in many places, uh, I mean, I'm talking about real surveillance, which is having the ability to collect continuously data that is analyzable on real time and produces knowledge on real time. That, that is kind of the, the surveillance system that I talk about. Many places don't have it. Many places will have it after the pandemic or even have already implemented it. So that's number one. Number two, the capacity to react to the unknown. Uh, uh, I had uh, two papers that I work with in, in, um, in, in partnership with the College of Engineer at Khalifa on mathematical modeling and mathematical modeling that we use for many things in medicine uh, can be used in these circumstances with the right amount of data to, to try to find answers where the evidence is not available, when the unknown is still the rule. So, so we use that to program for uh, ICUs, for health workers, for frontline workers here, there, and everywhere, trying to predict what is going to happen tomorrow, three days, eight days. And of course, the longer in modeling that you go away, in the future, the, the more inaccurate the models are and the more frustrating the experiences are. However, the immediate results are very good. So we learn how to work with these uh, tools among other things. So number one, collecting data, collecting the right data, being able to analyze it because sometimes data is collectible, is collected, but it is not analyzable. It is, is, is electronic, digital, but it's like electronic paper. So you have to hand process it. And that is very frustrating as well and takes a lot of time. So, so we learned that. We learned that the system has to be very flexible. So allocating spaces that cannot transform in a pandemic is a problem. So in this case, ICUs were needed. Now places to vaccinate people are needed. The chains, et cetera, et cetera. So all those were lessons learned. Uh, the third thing, and I believe that I will stop there, was the, uh, the collaboration. Uh, people in normal times are many, 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 are very siloed. So, so the, the health sector, the private health sector, very isolated from uh, government, uh, very isolated from academia and so on and so on. So the, the horizontal integration that happened during the pandemic was unique. So, for instance, the university, which has the capacity to provide the vast amount of researchers, uh, completely stopped all the research and dedicated all the funds mm -hmm. just to support people that were going to do research in COVID-19. And I'm not only talking health research, I'm talking engineering, devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I believe that that in consortium with a coordination from the public health sector, which is in the front line seen at the population uh, magnitude of the pandemic, 
was very important. So we learn about data, we learn about flexibility of the health system, we, were, uh, we learn about evidence-based decision-making in fast changing times, and we learn about collaboration. Of course, trust, good government, good people, etc., are ingredients sine in qua non to be uh, successful. Thank you so much, Dr. Acuna. I have a few follow-ups, but uh, since we're uh, coming close to, to, to um, uh, the end of our session, I want to make sure to bring in um, uh, Mrs. Leila Jessamy and, ask, and follow up with you, uh, Leila, on a couple of things that Dr. Acuna uh, mentioned, uh, especially the fact that um, uh, health and education and, and these um, uh, issues uh, were, uh, to a certain extent, an afterthought when it came to government planning. Um, as as um, now, as we are in this moment, um, uh, do you see uh, public health becoming a critical element in foreign policy, homeland security, development strategies, trade agreements, um, and and how can um, governments develop the skills needed to, to really effectively mobilize uh, uh, resources to, to confront uh, future threats? Well, actually, adding to the two, uh, the, what my colleagues had mentioned earlier, I think it, it was a very, for us, it was a learning experience, I mean, which we haven't been through anything that, uh, and the whole world is still learning, and it is going to be a continuing learning process. So when it comes to public health, Public health having been um, that of a, such a crucial, important aspect in health, as we have learned and studied and how it is in Europe and the United States. So I believe through the pandemic, one of the lear learning lessons going to be for the government here is to place public health in a very crucial, important uh, aspect into the healthcare system, which we haven't seen before. This is what I'm aiming and which I'm hoping that this is one of the things that the government will take a decision on a national level for the public health. Improve, of course, the analytical tool, the surveillance uh, methodology uh, for the public health in case of an outbreak or a pandemic in the future, we never know. The data health, uh, we have a web resource of a, a data center in the UAE, which we don't have actually. And this is what uh, Dr. Kuna has mentioned, which I totally agree with. The segregation of data between the different public health authorities and the federal government, unfortunately, will not be able to help the future researchers and analysis and even investors coming into the, into the UAE. So therefore, these are one of the main critical items which I believe is going to improve in the coming years in the healthcare system in the UAE. One of the things, uh, going back to what you had mentioned, Raymond, earlier in your questions, is that what's going to impact the strategy going forward in the government? For me, being a UAE national and what I've been seeing going through this pandemic, there will be a massive change into the strategy of the government when it will come specifically for the health care system. If you haven't seen it before, the, uh, the encouragement of an AI and digital health into the healthcare. And this is something that the government, uh, the, um, the government officials, as well as the president and the vice president of UAE has mentioned, that there will be a lot of investment of the government into the healthcare system, because this is something that we always say that the healthcare workforce are always are the heavy soldiers. And this is what has been seen in the pandemic and what has been happening. So this is one of the things that I have I will be seeing changing in the coming future, as well as building the local workforce. Even though the UAE has stopped building into colleges and universities into the healthcare, but I think with this pandemic, one of the major lessons learned is that we do have to invest in our local workforce, wherever it takes as a nation. This is something that we are in need. We are a very young population. I think it's one of the mandates that we do need trust. Of course, I mean, I don't want to take a lot of time, but this is something which I believe my country was very successful in. We have really found the source of information for our public and for the people living in the UAE. And this is, has built up the trust of the community and to the government. And we had localized, yes, at the beginning, government were taking the lead into the pandemic, but then also we learned that we have to be part to the private sector and ask them to help the government going forward. So these are one of the quick 
uh, I think the success stories that we went into it during the pandemic, and yet we still have to go away further and learn a lot. This is really great. Thank you. And uh, incidentally, I mean, you mentioned investment in AI and local workforce. Incidentally, tomorrow's session uh, focuses on um, innovation and education uh, and the role that they play in, in, um, uh, in building more resilient societies, resilient to pandemics and, and other challenges. So I'm glad that, that um, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, these important issues that you, uh, you helped us identify. Um, uh, before getting to questions from the audience, I'd like to uh, just go back to um, uh, Dr. Nuzzo here and, and ask um, about, um, you know, also lessons learned uh, looking forward um, uh, and, and especially the role of governments um, like the UAE, because we mentioned uh, here and, and others, uh, not necessarily just the UAE. Uh, what can governments do to establish uh, hubs for scientific collaboration, uh, ensure know-how is available to uh, especially in the case of, you know, uh, Gulf uh, countries that, that we focus on, uh, they are resource, resource rich. They have the, the, um, uh, the ability to, to uh, invest in, in, these, in these areas. Uh, but what, what can they offer to uh, other less fortunate, uh, less developed countries uh, in terms of know-how, in terms of, of combating uh, pandemics? Sure, so I think I a huge lesson learned is that, um, particularly when you have an event of this size, um, the research efforts are not necessarily always going to be spearheaded by governments. Nonetheless, it's really helpful if governments collaborate with the kind of spontaneous research that happens. And, you know, I say this um, have, as someone who spends a lot of time uh, tracking COVID data and um, working on an incredible, with an incredible team that has, you know, assembled the global map that analyzes testing trends around the world and just, you know, finding the data that are out there that are available. Um, this is not to supplant the role of government. In fact, you know, the ideal is that government's in the middle, but I think when it comes to some level of analyses, you know, government abilities are going to, or, or bandwidth at some point is going to be limited. And so I think governments need to plan for the fact that non-governmental actors, academia, um, volunteers, you know, even just people with quantitative skills, et cetera, have talents that can be marshaled and, and brought into, um, I think, collaborative research efforts internally. Um, internationally, you know, I think one of the fundamental lessons that has come out of COVID-19 is on the value of global cooperation, in particular when it comes to the evaluation of medical countermeasures. The data from the global um, clinical trials, you know, have been fairly robust, and I think they um, allow us to gain insights that are harder to do when um, individual nations launch their own studies with um, smaller pools of, of patients. So I do think um, planning to do work uh, uh, collaboratively with other countries on you know, medical countermeasure evaluations, um, establishing protocols for how that's going to be done to make sure it's done ethically and safely and to maximize um, the data gathering possibilities. I think those are um, uh, things that governments should, should also plan to do. And then I also think we need to kind of um, broaden our view of what research is. And as much as the clinical trials have been absolutely essential to help us better understand what, um, you know, what um, therapeutics may or may not work and the, the, the development of vaccines, I also think we have a lot to learn about um, you know, what strategies work to control the virus? What, um, what communication strategies work to, to uh, motivate behavior change? And, um, you know, this is also a place where I think there's international collaboration. Um, in the introduction of me, it was mentioned that I run a project called the Outbreak Observatory. And, um, you know, we set that up um, really because the practitioners on the front lines of outbreak responses are the people who know the most, but they never have the time to stop and do uh, you know, do the analyses that documents what they've been learning and, and how their strategies have evolved or not, the lessons learned, what has worked, what hasn't, what are the biggest challenges, what resources are used, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, we, we stood that observatory up as a way to um, partner with practitioners on the front lines to at least kind of capture and document and disseminate that information as much as possible. Um, and, you know, we have learned a tremendous amount. We're doing um, studies right now on COVID, um, particularly with the vaccination rollout and also trying to understand um, testing and surveillance strategies. But, you know, it, it, it really takes a, a global village to do this work and it should be um, more of us trying to do the work, particularly those of us who have a little bit more bandwidth and the skills to do operational research. And I really think that governments can help support that. It's not an area of research that typically 
gets funding from basic science um, agencies because it's applied research. But I can tell you, uh, we did an analysis of the 2014, 2016 Ebola um, epidemic. And um, we looked at all of the papers published um, during and after e that epidemic. Um, it dwarfs the a number of Ebola papers ever published prior to that event. But when we looked at the papers, the, the number, the percentage that were um, trying to answer questions like, how do we stop the transmission of Ebola? How do we communicate with people about um, their exposure and, and uh, you know, so that they don't get infected? All of those really operationally important questions, you know, do we quarantine and how? Um, fewer than 3% of all papers produced were actually oriented around that. So the, the basic science, the clinical science, that stuff tends to get done. The, the basic epidemiology tends to be, um, you know, researched and, and disseminated, but those operational questions aren't. So I really think, you know, if governments want to know how to act next time, we need to, you know, plan to be able to collect and analyze the information that will um, provide the data that we need in order to inform our strategies. Mm -hmm. Right. So much uh, has, has been said about uh, the importance of data collection and sharing that and, and using uh, the data in, in the right way as well. Uh, before I move on to questions, uh, any, any comments from, from the other panelists on, on this question or anything to add? Uh, no, just, just a general comment that I, I, I believe that, that, of course, we when we were at CC or at CC, one of the things that is said is secondary gain out of catastrophes. And, and I do believe that the pandemic uh, is going to bring a lot of uh, uh, improvement in in the health sector in general globally. So, so I cannot believe that uh, uh, having done uh, as many things as I personally could, could do and some governments could do, some institutions could have done without having the pandemic happen. So, so it, it's a very unfortunate circumstance, especially when you see that sometimes it goes well, worse uh, because of people, not because of the pandemic in per se. Uh, but uh, but I believe that the lessons learned are good, and they are going to improve the sector, the health sector. Great. So uh, let me move on to to questions from the audience, and this question uh, is uh, um, for uh, Dr. Nuzzo, um, and then I'll, I'll read it. Uh, I'll try not to butcher it. Um, you mentioned that the current coronavirus pandemic in itself might not even be the biggest health challenge we're likely to face going forward. Uh, could you please expand on this and give us your thoughts on what might be coming? What lessons learned you see as instrumental to be better prepared for it? Yeah, I mean, I really hate to be the bearer of really yet more depressing news. I, I mean, COVID-19 has already done a good job of of, of being quite challenging. But, you know, if you look at the data, I mean, just, you know, take a step back, you know, and reflect on what's happened before this. Um, you know, if it feels like you keep hearing about all these new viruses, um, that's because you are. And the data clearly shows that the emergence uh, of new virus, viruses, um, new, new pathogens um, are, is increasing. And um, with that, then <laughs> the question is, um, are we better, are, are we able to stop those viruses from from spreading, particularly if they you know acquire the ability to to be easily transmitted between people, um, it's very hard, particularly for respiratory viruses like this one. But um, you know I do believe that there's more that we can do to be better at that, and um, you know even if we aren't, um, you know, I think we have to plan for the fact that um, these these events will keep happening. And if we are imperfect in our responses, we are likely to be, it will pose challenges to at least some countries. And potentially, if it's another virus like this, all countries at once. And so um, I think we have to plan for that. Then, of course, because we're also talking about security, I would be remiss if I didn't say that a naturally emerging um, pathogen is not the only possibility. There is, of course, um, you know, concerns, and um, I think we have to plan for the possibility that um, a, a pathogen, um, you know, even potentially an engineered pathogen, could escape from a laboratory, or that there could be a deliberate attack. Um, now, these are you know difficult things to talk about and hard scenarios to to kind of wrap our minds around, but. I can tell you if we don't think about them and if we don't plan for them, um, you know, I think we should expect to see potentially consequences that are far worse than COVID-19. 
um, which is hard to imagine given the extraordinary tolls that this virus has had. But um, nonetheless, the possibility exists. And I think we would be better off planning for them and having them not happen than just, you know, hoping they don't. Uh, that's such a good point uh, and something that we didn't really fo focus on at uh, the specter of uh, uh, possible deployments of biological weapons and uh, um, something that we should uh, definitely keep in mind and, and look uh, more into going forward. Um, uh, Dr. Acuna, anything to add uh, to that or um, also uh, bring in Mrs. Ajasimi with any further comments too, please. Well, just a parallel thought on something that that I believe is important. Uh, we, we, we just saw and we have the pandemic. And then again, I always describe it as a stress test for the health system or the health sector. But I think it was also a stress test and a very revealing one about the issue of the production of, for instance, in this case, vaccines. So we were able to produce a, 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 a large amount of different types of vaccines in record time. And then you wonder, why can we not do that always? Why is it that is wrong with the overall production of therapeutic area uh, and treatments uh, uh, that is that is hindering the production of new medications and new drugs and new vaccines into the years of development when now we know that uh, if there is interest, uh, fear, money involved and some other things, uh, we can do that in no time. So, so people have doubted that the data that is coming from the vaccine trials uh, and, and one thing that we learned is that we could have sensible process. Maybe we were in one extreme in the pandemic, but we certainly were coming from the other extreme when developing a new vaccine. Uh, people took it as normal that it would take 10 years or eight years or something like that. And nobody saw that as with preoccupation. So I think that one of the things that need to happen is that we need to uh, we need to acknowledge that that we can do better in almost any sector. Uh, we just need to be uh, into it. Uh, and if we are into it in the whole health sector, uh, maybe we'll be much better prepared for something like this or one of the other scenarios that Jennifer put together uh, or, or exposed uh, in the future. And I do agree that that maybe we are seeing the tip of the iceberg. I hope that we're not right, certainly. Sister so Jessamy, anything to add to this? Yeah, I believe, I mean, adding to my colleague's point, I think there will be a lot of uh, pro new processes and procedures that different governments is gonna take into account going forward to, I mean, to, to take care of any anything <clears throat> Come. I mean, any outbreak or any pandemic that might happen because we never know what can happen in the future. But I believe that government officials is going to take certain restrictive measures. So the whole face of living, I believe it will not go back as it used to be before the pandemic. And I'm talking from perspective from the community. I mean, this is what I hear. This is what I have been feeling and sensing from the people around me is that they all believe that we will not go back as what we used to be. Life is going to be changed. And we've seen it that. We've seen it even at the work. We've seen it at workplace. We've seen it into the different sector, uh, whether, whether it is health, whether it is education, which, whether it is a economy. I mean, we have seen a lot. The face of work has changed. And we always ask ourselves, do we have to be in the office 24-7? for eight hours, 16 hours. I mean, even the methodology of working has changed. And I think this is gonna continue. So it has impacted all of us. Going back to the vaccine, I think this is really what, what I would believe in is that it's gonna enhance a lot of the collaborative efforts that's gonna happen between the different industry and between countries. And this is we have seen in the vaccine as Dr. Kuna mentioned. I mean, Germany works with the US, I mean, UAE works with China and so forth, you know, to produce a vaccine. Why this has not happened before? Why we were a country was competing into a vaccination? However, there is one valid point that we have not to forget. Building the trust of the community, of the people, 
to us. It's very important because this is, I believe, what we are facing and this is the challenge we are going with the vaccine. Building the trust of the people, of the public into taking this vaccine. So there is a lot of questions that we need to answer to the people about the efforts that we are making. If this research that we have done is enough to produce this vaccine, then we have to assure our people about this. Because this is that is why we have seen you know, all the countries that have provided the vaccine voluntarily for the people. Because I think this is one of the smart moves in order to build up the trust of the people into this new coming vaccine. So in generally, I believe is that the collaborative efforts between the different governmental, between different countries can change with this pandemic. And also the face of work and the face of living is going to be changed. Great, thank you. We have um, another question that um, about mental health that I feel the question itself is very specific and perhaps better directed to, to mental health professionals. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, perhaps what I can do is bring in the aspect of mental health into this discussion. Um, we've seen, of course, the, the, uh, when the pandemic take, take a, a great toll on, uh, on the mental health of, of everyone who is going through it, be it through um, uh, you know, uh, lockdowns, separation from family members, uh, as, you, as you were saying, uh, Mrs. Jessamy, the, the reconfiguration of, of, of the way we work, of the way we live, the way we interact with, with others. Um, how can we, you know, how can governments take this more into consideration? Uh, uh, one, in terms of uh, kind of building more capacity to, to, uh, to um, uh, ensure um, uh, mental health care uh, or, or to uh, incorporate mental health uh, into uh, uh, responses to, to pandemics and, and other uh, serious events like that. And this is uh, directed to, to everyone. Uh, if you allow me, Raymond, uh, I will talk from the experience that we went through. I think mental health uh, wasn't being given a lot of attention at the beginning of the pandemic, which is actually was a very crucial part for the community and what was happening because people was panicking toward what has happened and it has really impacted a lot of people. And I have seen it a lot between family members, between friends, and even hearing from the other stories of, uh, from different, uh, I mean, uh, people background, regardless of the ethnicity, whether they are a UAE national or expat or what so forth. So, and then what, what has happened, I believe, is that the government realized the, the matter that has been happening. Now, what we have done here, we have allocated a total free number for the community to call the mental health specialist, whether it is a physician or it is a psychologist, a social worker. And this total free number is 24 hours. So for the people to call in to ask whatever question they need, if they need to come to the hospital or they need an assistant. But I didn't see it as it is enough. I felt that mental health should have been actually tackled in more broader perspectives in all the levels and from the beginning. But as I said, it was a very learning uh, process for us. And we have noticed that. However, the government tried their best to provide the treatment, the counseling for the public as much as they can. But I feel still there is a lot to be done into this. However, there are a big shortage when it comes to the uh, service provider and the mental health, because you find a lot um, of a free uh, consultation, free assistance that you will get from the federal government or from local mental health. However, if you reach to the private sector, you have to be paid for. And having the insurance uh, system support mental health, this is one of the gaps that we do have which I believe we should overcome for the future. Because as we overcome the telemedicine consultation and the digital health coverage into the um, health insurance system in the UAE, I think we should also overcome the uh, mental health counseling in the health insurance system. So this is one of the things that I would like to share with you all from the mental health perspective here in the UAE. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Anyone else? I'll just say that I'm really worried about the mental health impacts of 
of this pandemic. Um, two reasons. One, I mean, the global economic downturn that we're seeing, I think we have you know, fairly good data from 2008 that um, that global recession um, had a huge consequences for, for mental health uh, across the world, in particular um, suicides. So we, you know, are now experiencing um, economic consequences that are, you know, far greater. So that makes me worry, but also the, the isolation and, and um, you know, how incredibly difficult uh, this pandemic has been for people who have been separated from their friends, their families, um, in some cases, their worship services. Um, so all the kind of the, the coping um, uh, resources that people have, have have also been taken away. And I, I don't think, um, you know, we, we're even talking enough about that potential coming um, crisis and um, really think it's something that governments should be actively thinking about. Dr. Acuna, anything to add to that? No, I, I agree that mental health was uh, relegated to way, way down in the scale of important things on not only clinical, but public health. And uh, since probably about a decade ago, uh, it, it has been shown and it has been proven that, that mental health affects so many issues in life that it needs to be important. And fortunately enough, now the importance is well known. However, many of the systems have not been quite just yet developed to, to attend the real need and the real burden produced by issues in, in the field of mental health. Uh, it, is, it is not my, my clinical field of expertise. Uh, however, I did manage uh, uh, one particular part, which is postpartum depression, uh, which has not been, was not clearly recognized as something important. And when we started digging deeper, into into these uh, particular circumstances, it was it was it was devastating. It, it would kill women, kill children, and and the link was not readily made. So so I do think I I, I echo the opinions of, of my two colleagues on that mental health needs to be uh, in the forefront and especially in the pandemic is one of the things that we need to follow uh, in the in the post pandemic, if we can ever get to that stage uh, era. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we've, we've uh, answered all the pressing questions from our audience members. So uh, um, unless anyone has anything more to add, I think I'll take this uh, opportunity to uh, let you go back to your day jobs or to your vacations. Uh, well, much deserved vacations, I should say. Um, and, and thank you again for, for making the time to join us and to share uh, your insights on this extremely important topic that uh, uh, not just um, uh, health professionals uh, are concerned with, uh, but uh, policymakers on all level. Uh, that's why we chose it uh, as one of the topics for our security conference this year. Uh, so thank you again um, and look forward to staying in touch and to having you with us uh, to share maybe uh, uh, better news uh, in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. Thank everyone. Take care. Thank you to our Bye -bye. audience for joining us. And uh, please make sure to uh, join us tomorrow again for the session uh, looking at innovation education uh, uh, that um, uh, and, and the, the important role that they play in building a more resilient society and more resilient economy. So thank you and hope to see you all tomorrow.